Okay, everybody. Um, the first area we're going to look at for lectures during um, chapter 8 is surface area. And the book doesn't say this, but it's always of three-dimensional objects, okay? So whenever we had two-dimensional objects, like um, we've, we've worked with rectangles or trapezoids or whatever, anytime we've had two-dimensional objects, the most we can do is maybe we find the perimeter, right? That's a rectangle, in case you were wondering. Maybe we can find the perimeter, um, or maybe we can find the area, which is the total space that this object covers, right? But we haven't done surface area because surface area requires that I have more than one surface, okay? So in this case, this surface is just one surface, so we just call it area. But a lot of times I'll end up with things, these are called three-dimensional objects or polyhedron, okay? Is And the polyhedron means, let me throw that in here, polyhedron, basically it just means many faces is the way most people interpret that. Okay, many being multiple faces. Okay, so if I have a two-dimensional object, there's basically just one face, right? And in most cases for a polyhedron, you're gonna have um, six or more sides, right? Six or more faces. So whenever we look at this die, we call it a six-sided die, but it's really six-faced dies, right? Die, because it's got every plane that's on it is its own face that's considered a face. So as I look, that's the one that most people are used to dealing with, right? That die. So as I look at it, and heaven knows, I am not a good artist, and three-dimensional objects are certainly not my, my forte. But whenever I go to draw a three-dimensional, in this case, cube, I usually will take a square, offset another square with it, and then just connect the corners. So if you also have a difficult time drawing three-dimensional objects, that's not such a bad cube, right? I'm just saying. I know a lot of people are really well versed and they can put the dot lines and stuff like that. I'm not good at that. So that's my cube, okay? So as I look at this cube, in fact, um, in schools, I heard where public schools a lot of times don't even call these dice anymore. They call them decision cubes or choice cubes or something like that. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, because it's a cube, I do agree with that. But when you look at that, they, you have faces here, right? So like I'm gonna shade just this front face, what I feel is the front face of this die for me. Okay, it takes up all of that space. It's on its own plane, vertically, perpendicular to the ground in this case. They don't always have to be perpendicular to the ground. In fact, in your book, they'll talk about things that are oblique. Oblique meaning, um, it leans, that's what, that's what oblique more normally means. We, when we use oblique in say college algebra or something, we usually mean slanted, slant height, slant asymptotes, oblique asymptotes, those are normally the same kind of thing. So something, uh, I've, I've shrunk my thing, sorry, but you'll get the picture. So obliques kind of, this would be flat on the surface area, the surface of your table or whatever and then the rest would be kind of slanty. So this would be this would be on the surface, everything's slanted over. So it's not at right angles, that's the idea, okay? So these are oblique and these are right because we know that the vertical is at a 90 degree angle with the horizontal there, right? Okay, so that's why we call it right. All right, so most of the time though, we'll deal with things that are indeed right polyhedron. So this guy, he's six-sided, six faces. Um, as I look at one of the planes, each surface is its own plane normally. We're going to see it like that. That guy is a face, okay? So here I shaded the front face here. That entire in this case, it's a square looking at me. That entire surface is one face. And then I have two other words that I usually use whenever I'm talking about polyhedron in general. So one is an edge. And so basically, normally that's a line. Okay, but it's, 
yeah, we'll call it a line. Line, normally. Where two faces meet. I should put that here, face dash. And that will be an edge. Okay. I can put it back here, which is where I started to put it, but I don't know why. Okay, so here I have this side here of the die, this face going on, and here I have the front face. This line right here, where those two planes meet, is, so it's because it's two planes meeting, right, that it's a line. That line there is an edge. This is a face. The line where they meet is an edge. So what's happening is two planes meet and form a line of intersection. So in the past, whenever we've talked about intersection, again, we were just doing two dimensional drawings. We might have two lines that overlap and they meet and they intersect at a point, right? But here I've got this side face and the front face. They're on two different planes. They will meet on an edge. So again, on this die here, say so I've got the face that has the four on it. I've got the face that has a one on it. Where do they meet? Well, they meet right along this edge. So there you go. That whole entire line there, that's the edge. Okay. And then the last word, do y'all know it? The last word is actually called a vertex. Now we know that word from some other stuff, but in this case, it is the point. And again, I'll put the word normally. I guess we could have other stuff <laughs> that happens other than a point, but it's the point where more than one edge will come together or intersect. Okay, so again, looking here on the die, I've got the face with the four, the face with the one, where this edge here, here I've got another edge between the four and the five, this edge here, where those two edges meet is a point here the red's gonna work for me. And that point right there is called a vertex, okay? In fact, it happens that there's an edge here, an edge here, and an edge from below, right? There's an edge that goes between the five and the one, and that edge there. And all three of those edges, so it's more than one edge, meeting in that one point. So that one point right there on, on my die, in this case, is what we're gonna call a, uh, a vertex. Okay, so this guy is a six-faced polyhedron, right? Because it's got six sides. Six-sided die is what we normally call it. But I had some other dice up here whenever I started. So let me pull those guys back out and we'll look at them. So here's one. Um, these are sometimes called probability dice. And the reason why is because if I look at them really closely, there's a nine... And over here on the even side, there's a zero. The zero represents 10, okay? So, um, or, or zero, okay? Normally, it's, it's the 10. So, for instance, if we were rolling two of these, we might say one of these represents the 10's value and one of these represents the 1's value. Well, if it's the 1's value, I can't put a 10 there, so I'd call it a 0. If it's the 10's value, then I can't put a 10 there. And it's called probability because probability goes between 0 and 100, not that we care for this class's purpose, but if I roll two of them, I've got two 10-sided dice here. So in the 10-sided dice, I've got 10 times 10, that's 100 possibilities, and that's where the probability comes from. Okay, again, you can see here, the zero is its own face, the four is its own face. In Real life, we call this a 10-sided die, you just heard me say that, but in geometry, we call this a 10 faced die, okay? Here's an edge that goes between the zero and the four. Here's a vertex where this meets this meets this, so there's actually 
three faces coming in together, the zero, the four, and the seven, and there's the edges between them, and there's the vertex where all three of them will meet, right here, that point. That's the point where they meet. And then I also have this vertex up here at the top, where if you look at it, there's a point right there where one, two, three, four, five faces are all, their edges between them are all coming together and meeting right there at that point, which is a vertex, okay? So this is a 10-sided die. This guy right here, if you look at him closely, let me show you the top of this one like I did the last one. There are four sides there, and if I flip it, there are four faces, I should use the real word here, the geometry word, four faces there. So all together, this is an eight-faced die, or if you're used to using those in some kind of gaming system, you probably call it an eight-sided die. Okay, same thing going on over here. I look at this guy, I see one, two, three, four, five, six faces on the top. There are six faces on the bottom, and you guessed it, it's a 12-faced die. Okay, here's one that has 20 faces, or if you were in statistics with me, we call it a 20-sided die. So you can see all the different faces, all the different planes, that are happening there, all the different edges, all the different vertices. And last but not least, the big one that I had up there, if we counted it, it would be a 30-sided die, okay? So as I look here, there's a face, there's a face. Each of these is slightly out of sync with all the other faces, so they're all their own little plane, right? If they were the same plane, then what? They'd be on top of each other, all right? They'd be in the same location. So this 20, face, this face for the 20, there's no other plane on this die that matches up with that or else it would be just right on top of it, they'd be in the same location, right? So 30 faces on this die. So all of those are considered polyhedron. There are all kinds of polyhedron though. Um, so you're gonna see some different ones in your book as you look through them. These are, like, like I said, dice where we play games with them and do interesting things with them. But I also have some examples of other stuff. So here's one. There are a lot of paper folding activities that deal with polyhedron. And if you ever go to the camp conference, which is a really great conference for math ed stuff, um, then you, you might see something like this that um, you would paper fold and create your own. In this case, it's a calendar. You can see it's from 2009, so it's a little old, but that's okay. I've saved it all these years because I thought it was so cool and I put it together myself. So each of these faces, if you look really carefully, there are 12 of them. They're all what? Like look around, they're all the same. And I've got one, two, three, four, five. This face is a what? A pentagon, right? Because it's got five, it's a five-sided, if I just look at this one surface here, okay? So that face is a pentagon. So this thing, it would be a solid object if it was, you know, if I printed it on a 3D printer or something. Instead, I made it out of paper, cardboard. So um, this thing is a 12-faced polyhedron, okay? Much like the 12 faced, where did it go? Um, die here that I showed you a minute ago. It looks the same, right? Similar, at least. And each face here is a pentagon. Well, when we were dealing with the six faced die here, each face was a square, right? Like just that one surface where the three is, that one surface, that face is a square. And if I looked at, for instance, here's the eight faced die and I look at that guy right there that face that has the eight on it that face is a triangle so what that tells me is if I put four triangles together on the top and four triangles together on the bottom then I end up with an eight faced polyhedron okay here this guy happens to have its own special name if it's a 12 faced and in particular this guy is considered regular because it uses the same shape to make it over and over again. So if it's a 12-faced polyhedron like this, 
it's called a dodecahedron, okay? So dodecahedron. Do meaning two, deca meaning 10, so two plus 10, 12, hedron, faced object, okay? It's kind of hard to see it on this 10-sided guy, but if you look really closely here at the face with the zero on it, it's kind of a kite. So see one, two, three, four. It has that lovely quadrilateral thing going on there. So it's a bunch of kites put together. Five on the top, five on the bottom. That makes you a decahedron, 10-sided, 10-sided, 10-faced, um, sorry. 10-faced hedron, okay. So 3D object, that's what that means. Okay, so anyway, this is kind of interesting. There are some unusual 3D objects that have more curvy things on them and are less, um, less, less sharp, angle, angular, straight faces like these are. These all are straight faces, right? They're, they're actually a plane. So there are some unusual things that are out there. For instance, let's just talk about the sphere for a second. This isn't really technically a polyhedron because how many faces does this sphere have? Just one, right? It goes all, it's, it's a never ending face basically. So this isn't really a polyhedron. It is a three dimensional object. And if you look hard enough in your book, we're not gonna do any homework over them. But if you look hard enough in your book, there are formulas for surface area and for volume of these guys. Um, along with that, thinking about the curviness there, um, I have a cone, right? So a cone, again, the, I'm gonna get a word in here. The base of this 3D object here, the guy that it's gonna set on normally, the base is a circle, right? Which is very related to a sphere, right? If I cut this sphere right down the middle and made a hemisphere, right? A hemisphere, oh, I have some of those. But if I cut that guy right down the middle, then the, the section that I'd be looking at would be a circle, right? So let me get one of those. I wasn't planning to use this guy, but I'll drag him in since I'm mentioning it. Okay, you can see right here, this thing, it's, a, it's actually a dice shaker, right? Okay, so I can work problems with young kids, shake it up. Ah, six plus six, make them do an, an arithmetic problem. So that's what this is really. But anyway, if I look at it on the side, you can tell this was part of a sphere, right? And hopefully it's a half. So it's a semi-sphere or a hemisphere is what we normally call it. And whenever I look at this base, it's a circle, right? Okay, so that's basically half of a sphere, not this sphere, but half of one. And so if I cut that sphere right down the middle, the cross section that I would be taking, the cutting of it would be circular, okay? So a similar thing's going on here with this cone. The base of it is circular, but as I come up, there's only one face here. And again, um, it's not quite if I cut this guy down the side, I think we'll see one in a little bit, I have one. So if I cut this down in the side, it's not quite gonna be a straight face like what we're used to if we lay it out. So we'll see that in a minute because I have some stuff that'll do this. Here's a cylinder, okay, again, flat. The flat part is a circle, the bases are circles. But what about this face of it? It's just one continuous face, right? So in general, if they have like this circular base kind of thing going on, or they're somehow related to a circle or a sphere, um, you're probably gonna have a problem. Here's a different cylinder. Again, the bases are the flat parts. Um, bases like this, we have two because this is kind of a, a prismy thing. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the face here is just continuous, right? There's just one face. So it's not really, those aren't really polyhedron. They are three-dimensional objects. And what does that mean for us for them to be three-dimensional objects? It means that we're going to be able to, if we want to, find all these formulas so that we can um, figure out their surface and their area and their volume. Um, I'm not doing those today with you. <laughs> so just because... That makes things a little bit more complicated for us if we add those in 
and honestly we're running out of class time in our class so I'm not going to mess with those for the purposes of this video for sure. However, just know that they're out there. Know that there are formulas for them. Um, know that, you know, you may be asked to do something with them. Okay, here's a different cone I happen to have here. We can tell it's a cone because it's got a flat surface. That's a circle. That's its base. Okay. And then as I look at it and from the side, I can see that it comes up to a point at the top that's like an ice cream cone, like if I turn it this way, right? There's an ice cream cone. If I turn it this way, maybe it's like a, a pointy hat that we would wear, um, something like that. So anyway, we see that this is a cone. And again, right here, this is just a circular kind of path, but it's weird because it looks kind of like a pyramid. That's one of the words we'll want to talk about. The pyramid has a base, but comes up to a single vertex at the top. Okay, one point at the top where everything comes together. So it's not this nice regular idea that we have with a prism. So here, this that I'm pulling out, this is called a net, N-E-T. Okay, so let me put that up here so we can see it. Nets are physical representations for surface area. Okay, physical representations for surface area. So if I want to talk about the surface area, what's the area on the surface of this item? I would talk about all the way around this face here that's a weird face, right? We can tell it's really weird. And then also I would need to talk about the base, the area of the base, and I would add those two together. So the base area plus the face area will give me my surface area. So the net, what it does, if I bring it out, you can tell it still looks just like the cone, a little, mostly like the cone, but it's made of this rubber that I can, or plastic, I think it's probably more plastic, that I can kind of flatten out, okay, and see. So it's very easy for me to see that the base is a circle, okay. We already saw that, no problem. But what they've done is they've taken this almost semicircle that is the, um, the surface area the lateral surface area going up and down is what that means, lateral, okay? They've taken that face and they've kind of split it into almost triangles. I say almost triangles because you can tell the base of this one's curvy. So if we did the coffee filter activity in class, you've seen something like this, right? So they took the, the coffee filter, so to speak, and cut it into a whole bunch of almost triangles. They're not quite triangles because this is curvy instead of flat, um, instead of a straight line segment there. But it it's similar, right? So whenever they go to make up the formula for this, what they're gonna do is they're gonna talk about how much of the full circle, if this were a full circle, would this represent right here? And then they're gonna say, okay, this is a certain percentage of that. So when you see that formula, again, we're not gonna mess with cones, but when you see that formula, you'll see how that comes together. The idea though being, for our purposes, surface area is gonna be all the area of the faces plus all the area of the bases, add that together. So surface area, that's where we're headed. The sum of the area, sometimes areas, of the base, sometimes that's bases, plus the area, sometimes the, of the face, and sometimes that's an S, faces. Okay, so any faces plus any bases, I'm going to add those together. That's going to give me the surface area. Okay, so real quickly, just to finish up on what we were talking about here, I'm going to bring out the, because I don't really want to focus on these circular ones, but I started them, so now i got to finish it. So I'm going to bring out the cylinder, okay? The net for the cylinder, you can see this is a cylinder. Again, the cylinder has two bases, right? It doesn't come up to a point, okay? 
like the cone does. So this is going to be more like a prism because prisms have two bases. We'll get definitions for those in a second. Okay, I see I've got a circle for the base, a circle for the base, both the top and the bottom. So those are the same, but you can look here and see, oh, the center there, if I split that cylinder down the middle, it basically is a rectangle, right? One big rectangle. So they've taken it and they've kind of sliced it into all these little rectangles because they want it to be able to bend and come together and make the face, the overall face of the cylinder. So it's kind of cool because whenever you take a cylinder, and I think this is actually one of your homework questions, you take a cylinder and you slice the face in half and you lay it out, the face, the overall face of that guy is actually one large rectangle, right? So that's kind of what's going on with cylinders for us. Okay, now let's get away from these curvy things because we don't really want to look at the, those too terribly much. I have, oops, two different other nets that we're going to look at. I actually have a lot of other nets, so I've got, there's, the cool thing about this topic for um, geometry is there are a lot, a lot, a lot of hands-on manipulative type things out there that you can use with your students, okay? These two, this one on the left, this one right here, that's a prism. I know it's a prism because it has two bases and it has faces, right? Okay, so prisms are going to have two bases that are... Um, congruent bases, by the way, same size, same shape, and then it's going to have however many faces it needs to do to make that sucker into a polyhedron, okay? <laughs> this one, in my other hand, is a pyramid. I know it's a pyramid because, again, it has a base, one base, and on the other end, the faces are slanted inward so that they come together in a point. So this one is much more like the cone was, a pyramid is, and the prism is much more like the cylinder was, okay? So looking at these, by the way, interesting little factoid, because this particular set is red. If you can see that, the bases for both of them, because they're red, the nets are red, the bases are both a triangle and look at that. They're the same size, right? We can see that. So like if I hold them up side by side, doo, 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 the bases are actually, oh, look at that. Kind of makes a rhombus. The bases are actually the same, okay? So kind of cool stuff about this is that um, any of my bases for, for this particular set that I'm dealing with are going to be, if they're triangular, they're all the same triangle, basically. If the bases are square, they're all the same bases, the same there. Okay, so let's talk about these. I've got two different things. They both have triangles for bases. Okay. One is a prism. Prisms have two bases plus multiple faces. In fact, the smallest prism that I can make is one that has a triangle for the base because that's the triangle, think about it, the triangle is the smallest two-dimensional object that's a closed object that I can make, right? So we started with triangles, then we went to quadrilaterals, then we went on to, up to pentagons. So if the triangle is the smallest two-dimensional, that means it's the smallest surface I can make, right, and still have a, a polygon for the base. So they're going to have polygons for the bases, and then they're normally going to have some kind of a polygon as the sides. Now, as I look at this prism, I see both of the bases are triangles, and I see one, two, three sides, because think about it, there's a side, a face coming down from here, there's a face coming down from here, and there's a face coming down from here. So however many sides that the base has, that's how many faces you're going to have in order for them to meet up with the other base. Does that kind of make sense? So three-sided base, this is a polygon, this is a triangle, means I'm going to have three 
faces, one, two, three, faces on my prism, okay? So that, interestingly, also, what kind of faces are they? Those are all quadrilaterals, right? Some kind of a rectangle, in fact, because they're all 90 degrees there. Okay, so let me pull that net out and let's look at it. Okay, remember the net is supposed to give me a nice physical representation for what's happening on the surface of this three-dimensional object. And even more so, it starts out three-dimensional and then I can make it 2D, right? So I can fold it out and show you. This represents the surface area of that guy, right? Let me zoom out a little bit so we can see the whole thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. And focus. focus. Oh, this one doesn't like to focus. Sorry, guys. Give me a second. There we go. All right, so here we go. There is my surface area from the triangular-based prism, okay, because it had a triangle for the base. It's a prism because it comes up to two bases, and that means that everything is nice and perpendicular to the ground. So this is actually a very right polyhedron, right, because it's not oblique at all. It's not slanty or anything like that. It's perpendicular to the ground, to the surface that I'm putting it on. Okay, so how would I find the surface area here? I would have a base that's a triangle. We can figure out that area, the area of a triangle, right? I have another base that's a triangle. These are congruent, right? We said that a second ago. So because these bases are congruent, all I have to do is figure out one of those and multiply by two. So there's two triangles. I know how to find an area of a triangle. And then here I have the rectangle, one, two, three faces. So we've got three rectangular faces here. And lo and behold, I know how to find the area of a rectangle. And because I can do that, I can find the area of these rectangles. Now you have to be a little bit careful. This one that I'm dealing with right now happens to be, you can see if I fold it over on top of itself, um, those are the same size. Those are the same size. The reason those are the same size is because this triangle that I'm dealing with is an equilateral triangle. But be a little bit careful because your triangles don't always have to be equilateral triangles. So if they gave me some weird scalene right, right triangle base, um, then my faces wouldn't be congruent, okay? In this case, they are, so I can take the, the area of one and multiply by three, but not always. So don't just assume, oh, they're all gonna be the same because that's not always the case, okay? So um, anyway, I know how to find the area of three rectangles, and then I add all those together, two bases plus three faces in this case, and lo and behold, that will give me the total area on all of the surfaces of this prism. Is that okay? All right, so whenever I say I'm gonna take two bases and multiple faces, if I wanna find the surface area of that, it's, it's really just as easy as figuring out the area of each of those particular pieces and then adding them all together. All right, so real quickly, let's talk about pyramids. Let me get back where I was earlier. Sorry, it'll be fuzzy for just a second. And then I'll fix it, I promise. All right, there we go. All right, so now pyramids. We said the difference between a prism and a pyramid is that a pyramid has one base. Oh, one base, not bases. Plus, again, it's multiple faces. Okay. But the difference being is that they all come together in one point. At one point. Which will be called a vertex, right? Okay. So um, it has multiple faces just like the pyramid did. But the pyramid, I'm sorry, just like the prism did. But the prism, they just went straight up from one base to the other. They didn't do this interesting little thing that, that pyramids do where they actually kind of converge, right? They started out as a, in this case, large triangle. And the bases 
were, were down here, but as they get together here, as they come to the top, they come to one point and they all meet in one point, the vertex up here, right? So interestingly, whereas the faces of the, oops, sorry, the faces of the prism were rectangles, right? The faces of this pyramid are what? Triangles, okay? So we can see that as we go along. So again, um, the base is here, okay? The center, in this case, the center triangle. Um, I can find that area pretty easily. The triangles on the faces though here, because they all come together in a point, okay? The, the surface area of those, the area of those, um, in this case, again, this is still an equilateral triangle, so these three are all the same triangle, but if it was not an equilateral triangle, then they would not be necessarily the same size. So, but I can find the area of three triangles and add those to the area of the base, right? So that's how I end up looking at that. So for a pyramid, I'm gonna add basically the areas of four different triangles. In this case, because the base was a triangle, okay? So that's interesting. There are tons of these guys. I'm gonna show you a few of the more common ones and then we'll break and talk about volume. I think I'm gonna make this into two videos just because I feel like I need um, to take a, a, a break between to, to gather my thoughts and change over. So as I do this, actually it might not take too long. Yeah, we'll see. Anyway, as I do this one, I'm looking, this is a pyramid, right? Okay, so I know it's a pyramid because it has one base and it comes up to a point, right? It has one vertex up here. If it was a prism, it would have two bases, okay? The difference is what? This base is not triangular. This base is actually square, but rectangular for sure, okay? So again, as I look at that, I say, hmm, this guy is interesting because um, he actually looks kind of like, this is, this is what the pyramids in Egypt look like, right? If I'm not mistaken, they actually have a square base and then triangles coming up the side whenever I look at them. So the faces of them are actual triangles. So as I look at that, how many triangles do you think there are gonna be? Is it gonna be three like the last one? I hope you're saying no, because as I come up from this edge here, I'm gonna come up to a point, that's what forces it to be a triangle. However, um, each edge, each face, I'm sorry, each side of the base here is gonna have its own face coming up, right? So because this is a four-sided base, I'm thinking I'd better have what? Oops, sorry, I know that's loud in the video. Sorry, four triangles, right? One for each edge that's coming off of the base, right? So four triangles, again, we know how to find those areas. We'll just add them all together, find the area of the square or the rectangle on the bottom, easy peasy, right? Sorry, sorry, I know these are really loud whenever it gets close to the microphone. All right, let's look at the one that goes with that. In this case, um, for this particular set that we have, um, as, I, as I put them together, and again, seeing that the bases are the same, they're both squares, as I look at the base here, the one that they gave me is actually a cube, right? But when I think about it, it has a cube, just like the dice that we were working with, has two bases, right? It's a prism. I know it's a prism instead of a pyramid because it's not coming to a point. It has the two bases and it has four faces, just like the die did, right? And in this case, they're all going to be squares because it is a cube and that means that they're all gonna be the same size if I can get it out of the thing. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't wanna let go of its case. All right, so these, this one here at the top, this one here at the bottom, those are the bases, and then one, two, three, four squares, and when I put them all together, of course we know how to find the area of a rectangle. So of course we know how to find the area of a square. So in that case, we're just finding the area of six squares. 
So then my question becomes, well, do all of the square prisms need to look like cubes? And I hope you're saying to yourself, no, no, that's not the case. It's not the case. And absolutely that's not the case. So think about some square prisms that we might have. I have several situations here you can see. Okay, so here are some. Um, again, pulling in different sets. Here is a rectangular prism. In this case, the bottom, the bases are squares and the faces, one, two, three, four of them are rectangles. Now, all of these are pretty regular. I'm not doing anything weird to us. If you look in the book, they're gonna have some lateral oblique stuff and all this. Now, lateral just means the, the vertical height, basically, the edge, the, the, the height coming up. Um, but, so if they say a lateral edge or something like that, they just mean the perpendicular to the ground, basically. Okay, but this guy kind of reminds me if you've taken a, a Math 372 class and done anything with algebra blocks, it kind of reminds me of that. And the same thing with this one. He kind of looks like an X, um, or maybe you've seen that in um, like, like uh, base 10 blocks or something like that, right? So when I look at this, this guy right here, the bases here would actually be this little square and this little square because the bases are congruent, right? And then the faces are one, two, three, four rectangles. So just think whenever I'm looking at it, the bases need to be the two that are congruent, same size, same shape. And then the faces are whatever is left over, okay? So that's what's going on there with those. And clearly they're not cubes, right? This is more like a block of cheese, and this is more like a tower. Okay, here's one. Oops, there's a lot of yellow going on here. Here's one that's more like a cigar box, is the way I think about it. Okay. It is not regular, and the reason I know he's not regular is because the base is not regular. The base here is a big rectangle. One, two big rectangles. Well, what does that do whenever I don't have a regular shape for my base? What's gonna happen to, for instance, these faces on the sides? They're not regular anymore. So what about those? It's a prism, so I'm gonna have rectangles, right? But when I look at the faces there, they're smaller, right? These faces on the long side are longer, okay? So as I pull this guy apart, and I look at his overall, I'm gonna have to zoom out us again, I'm sorry. As I look at his overall, even that's not gonna get me the whole thing. Um, his overall shapes that are coming in there. Oops, there we go. Here we go. I see, oh look, there's a big rectangle for each of the bases, those match, they're the same size. There are these two long rectangles and there are these two kind of shorter rectangles on the end, the flaps, right? It represents the entire area of each face and base whenever I stick it back together, right? So um, he's still a prism. He's still got a, a rectangular base, but he's different. Here's a smaller version, so here we go. Okay, we can see a little bit more what's going on. Here it's a rectangular base, uh, or I'm sorry, it's a square base. These two squares right here are the bases, and that makes me have some four rectangles, right? All right, um, not to belabor this too much, I'm going to show you a couple of other options. I'll show you um, one that's five-sided and one that's six-sided. Pick them wisely. One pyramid and one prism so that we're not doing it for every single case. So as I look at this guy, look at him. Is he a pyramid or a prism? I hope you're saying prism, right? Okay, so he is a prism. And his base here, let me show you the, the one that's not collapsing in. His base here is a what? One, two, three, four, five. Five-sided object, so it's a flat base pentagon, right? 
Okay, so he's got two pentagons. Those are his bases. That's why he is a prism. And what do you think that means for the faces coming off of here? There should be five faces coming down that will connect those two bases together, right? Okay, so let me pull this guy out. This is why I need a break is because I'm gonna have to move these things out of my way. I've got a pentagon and a pentagon. Those, the area could be a little more tricky to find, but I can split it up into triangles. And then I've got one, two, three, four, five rectangles. So that's how I would find his surface area. And one more. What is this guy? Pyramid or a prism? I hope you're saying pyramid, right? Because he's got one base and he comes up to a point. So that makes him a pyramid. Okay, what kind of base does he have? I hope you're saying hexagon. It's a regular hexagon, right? Okay, so what does that tell me? I see triangles going up, right? Because it starts out as an edge of the, the um, hexagon and it comes up to a vertex, so that forces it to be a triangle. That's why pyramids have triangles and prisms have rectangles. Um, but how many of them am I gonna have? How many triangles? Six, right? One for each side or each edge coming off of the base. I'll have a face coming down and there better be six of them. So that lets me know if I've got the entire um, surface area accounted for or not, right? Here's my hexagon. Here are my triangles. One, two, three, four, five, six of them. So sure enough, I've got that, okay? All right, so that's an idea of polyhedron and how you would find their surface areas. What's the difference between pyramids and prisms? There is a homework assignment. I'll give it to you on the learning management system online. So take a look at that. I think that's it for surface area. This is probably the longer of my videos for tonight. Um, yeah, I think the only definition I didn't really give you is lateral so just so that you know that word because it's going to come in as you're looking at um, some of the homework the lateral I mentioned it but that's more of a vertical or slant height and so they'll say stuff like what's the lateral face Well, on this pyramid that we just had, the lateral faces are all the different triangles, right? Because those are the ones coming up from the base, and so they're, they're um, in this case, they're slanted, right? Because they're coming into a point. If I was looking at this pentagon, that's a prism, okay? The lateral faces are the ones that are, in this case, perpendicular to the ground, right? Because they're just coming straight up. There's no slant to them. So in that case, they're vertical or perpendicular to the ground. Perpendicular to the table, we'll say. Okay, lateral face. Or they might say a lateral edge. Again, that'll be more of the height that's coming up away from the base and not so much the, uh, it's not the bases, right? So keep that in mind. So that's what they mean whenever they use the word lateral. So there you go. I think that's it for surface area, and I'll be right back with volume. Yay.